That's what I was supposed to do one minute sooner. But we will be having a recording uh, Q&A session uh, at the end of this program. So in the course of the program, if you have any comments and questions, please type them into the Q&A, hit the Q&A button, type them in there, and we'll best do our best to get you some answers at the end of the program. So without further ado, here's Jim. Great. Thank you, Bill. Hi, everybody. Glad you were able to tune in tonight. Uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to share some things I've learned with Loons over the three decades of work. So we're, the talk's going to go around 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for questions afterwards as we kind of go through it. So I'm going to give you just a little background on myself before I kind of dive into the talk. I first started studying loons in 1993 full time in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan at Sydney National Wildlife Refuge. This is me releasing a bird that I caught. And you might notice like two white drops of paint at the base of the bill. I used that to distinguish males and females when I had them in the hand and was able to separate male and female roles out in the field. That picture in the bottom left is 2011 where I was up on the, uh, on the North Slope in the Brooks Range working with other species of loons. And that was one of the highlights of my career to be up on the North Slope for some time, observing caribou and Arctic fox. And then this is me recently at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, measuring loon skeletons. So as Bill has mentioned, I've been at this at a long time and been very grateful for the opportunity to study loons as long as I have. So this map shows you where I've done research over the last 30 years. And a field season might be as short as two weeks, but oftentimes they're two months, four months, or even six months long. Most of them are supported by grants that I would have written, and I would hire people to assist me or help me in working on these projects. So just briefly, a couple of years up in Alaska, three years in Saskatchewan, four years in Washington State, two years in Nevada, two years in Southern California, seven field seasons off the coast of Louisiana, six in a wildlife uh, reservoir in South Carolina, six in New England, and then 12 field seasons in the Midwest. And most of those have been breeding, wintering, and migration. And I would say a big interest of mine has been wintering loons since about 2004. And we've learned quite a bit about breeding biology of loons. And I felt like that was starting to get saturated. And I was looking forward to learn more about loons. And I thought there was an open niche in the winter. So I spent quite a bit of time catching loons in the winter and studying them. And I'll share some of the, my, my findings with you today. So briefly, I thought like three tiered structures, some real basic loon 101. Being an academic, I can't help myself, apologize. And then number two is like a loon researcher's toolkit. What do loon biologists use to study loons? How have we used and incorporate the technology to learn loon behavior, loon ecology? And then I'm briefly gonna talk about loon conservation. So here's our loon, and we can all tell stories about loons. We're fascinated by them, mega charismatic species, black and white checkered back, the necklace, the red eye, just gorgeous birds. In Europe, they're known as the great northern diver, and they belong to a particular group called Gabiaformes. There's five, other, five species of loons that make up this group. So they're diving birds, they feed on fish, they nest inland on freshwater lakes, and predominantly winter in marine environments. So here you can see in breeding plumage, the red-throated loon, it's a small loon across Canada and most of uh, Europe and Eurasia, the Pacific loon, the Arctic loon, you can see a white flank towards the rear of that individual, and then a yellow-billed loon, which is the rarest, and the one with this uh, restricted uh, geographic range. So loons predominantly breed in Canada. Canada, 94% of all the breeding loons in the world breed in Canada. So you can make an argument, loons are you know, birds of Canada, national birds. So here you can see them across Canada and they dip into the lower 48. So about 2% of the population of breeding loons is in the lower 48, which of course Maine would be one of those states. And then if we're looking at the dark gray, we're looking at the winter distribution of loons. And you can say they go all the way from Alaska down to the Baja Peninsula. And then from the coast of Labrador and Nova Scotia around the Gulf into Mexico. So they winter in over wide geographic ranges. And we also see them now in freshwater reservoirs where that little range map is in South Carolina and Tennessee. So loons will migrate to the coast. Those in the interior might, might migrate 2,000 miles. Those along the coast might just have to migrate 200 miles. 
And that's going to have different effects on the on the size and geographic spatial distribution of loons. So here's a breeding loon, and then one that's less known is a wintering loon. So loons molt during late late summer, early fall. So they lose their necklace, the white checkered back, and they become gray and uniform. And sometimes they're mistaken for cormorants because of a similar body shape to some extent. So loons feed predominantly on fish, but they will feed on invertebrates. And what they're most noted for are divers. They are exceptional divers. They're highly streamlined, looking at this loon here underneath the water. Its feet are far back. So they can rotate their legs, just like we can rotate our arms in contrast to their hips. So they have great flexibility and mobility in their hip, hip region, but they can extend that leg 270 degrees to get power on its stroke. And we'll show you a picture of what that looks like here. This is from the Museum of Natural History in DC. And here's a loon skeleton. And to be streamlined through the water, just like a torpedo would be, they have narrow shoulder girdles, narrow hip girdles, elongated legs, and of course the feet are far back. So unlike penguins who use their arms for flapping, right, loons just use their feet for propulsion. And because of that, their feet are so far back, their center of gravity is shifted, they cannot support their weight with their legs. And that's why they stumble up on, onto the nest and stumble across land and where they get their name clumsy from in different languages, from Icelandic and Swedish languages, we feel that's probably where they got their name loon from. So these are some pictures of loons diving underwater. And what I wanted to point out to you is on the one, the wing does not extend beyond the body. So the wing is very narrow. To be streamlined in the water, that wing needs to be compressed to the body. If it extended beyond the body, it would create eddies and whirls and would slow the, the speed, uh, create drag, for example, on the bird and slow it down. And the other one, I have a picture on the sternum or the breastplate on a loon. And on a loon, you'll notice the breastplate is very flattened, so they have very flat chests. So now this is a picture of the breastplate of a loon. And what I'm showing you is the keel, where on a chicken or a turkey would be very extensive, or a duck even for muscle attachment. Yet on a loon, it's very narrow. And so there's very little room for muscles to attach. So consequently, their chest muscles are underdeveloped compared to other birds. And that has consequences. So here we see a loon's surface area extending its wings. Its wings are, are long, but they're narrower than predicted for their body size. And that creates low surface area compared to volume of the weight of the bird. So if this makes it difficult for a loon to get off the ground because its muscles are underdeveloped and the surface areas of the wings are narrow. And consequently, most of us recognize that loons, when they take off from the water and need a running start, often one to 200 yards, they point into the wind in order to help them gain lift, just like in a, a plane would, for example. All right, so we made it through part one, part two. So University of Minnesota Press, published this book on the common loon in 1988 by Judy McIntyre. Outstanding book, I read it and just fell in love with it and really started to fall in love with loons about that time. And Judy's, to her credit, tried to identify some research for future researchers to work on. And one of them, she said, we really need a consistent way to band or catch individual loons so we can identify them from each other. So in this picture here, we see two loons. We'd love to know which one's the male, which one's the female. We'd love to know, are they the same birds that come back each year in the lake? Do they move around to other parts of the lake? And it's just imagine like when we see chickadees or blue jays at our feeder, we would like to know these as individuals because then you can follow their fates and you can learn so much natural history and behavioral information, which leads to population information and conservation. So the breakthrough really came in 1989 with Dave Evers, who was a graduate student at Western Michigan University, was trying to figure out how to catch loons consistently. So Judy McIntyre had did some work on that. And people who were catching ducks realized if you go out at night, you have a little more success than going out during the day. And Dave's success came through is when he had a tape recorder. So he approached the loon when they had chicks when they were really small. And when he, when he played a tape recorder, the loon turned around and came towards the boat 
in which case you were able to have a large salmon landing net and scoop up the bird. And then once you had the bird in the hand, then you can band it and gather all kinds of useful information. So this is Dave taking blood and getting feathers. And Dave was interested in like ecotoxicology of loons. So did they have mercury? Did they have lead? What was their contaminant load? And most biologists, if not nearly all of them, will tell you once you have a bird or a wild creature in the hand, you want to gather as much information as possible from it before you release it. So you want to take weights, you want to take measurements. Uh, with, this is us taking bill measurements. This is measuring surface area of the wing. And then here's us putting bands on loons. So every loon will get a federal band, a seven digit number, which identifies where it was banded. And then a color band. And this was literally the major breakthrough because it allowed researchers to follow individual birds. So I literally mentioned here, it opened the floodgates. And Dave, I don't know, those of us have seen Forrest Gump, we think about a running fool for Forrest Gump. I hope that I say this complimentary to Dave was a banding fool because Dave just loved banding loons and then he taught others how to ban loons. Got a great team of researchers of which I was one to ban loons. And his work, his organization, Biodiversity Research Institute, has banded over 5,000 loons over these 30 years of time. So it's just been tremendous amounts of information that we've gathered on individual birds. And as the band's combinations got more complicated, we needed to really keep track because a simple yellow band on a bird or green or blue. So we ended up putting dots and stripes. And this just shows you all the color combinations that are on loons throughout North America. So our job now was to reobserve these banded birds. And then this would eliminate guessing if it was the same individual in the corner of the lake, a different region of the lake, how far they may have migrated, for example. So these were some questions that we were able to answer fairly empirically. Do they return to the same lake, the same territory? Do they pair with the same member? Do chicks come back to the lake they were hatched? Do they disperse if they do, how far? How old do they live? And just some fundamental knowledge that helped us understand the life history of these birds. And so one of the studies I undertook was observing banded loons from sunrise to sunset year after year, logging over 5,000 hours of observation on banded loons. And the one thing that I did was by putting those stripes, it allowed me to identify males and females. And so I didn't have to see the bands because most of us probably recognize it's pretty hard to see bands on loons. And normally we'd see them when they roll over and preen and show, re reveal their belly, then we can pick up the color bands. But I wasn't able to do that. And so I came up with this technique that allowed me to identify males and females. So now some of the things we've learned was that they do not mate for life. They probably have two or three partners during their lifetime. One partnership lasted 17 years, but most last about six or seven years. We do know that several loons have made it past 30 years. Several loons have not made it to 30 years. So maybe 30 years is definitely gonna be considered an old loon. And it'd be interesting to see as time, with time, a couple of these birds are still living if we go past 40 years. Chicks do tend to return to the same area where they were born. And then if those areas are occupied, they may disperse to adjacent lakes, generally within two to three miles of the lake in which they were born. Females might disperse a little further than males. And then what we've done is we've recorded loons when they give out their yodel, for example, and we can see that they repeat the same yodel year after year, and that each bird is distinctly different in very subtle ways from its neighbor. And one thing that researchers have found is that if one loon lost its territory, and move to a different corner of the lake or a different lake, it would actually alter its tune very slightly, indicating almost like it changed its communication. Now, what might be surprising or potentially not, depending on if you're on a lake where there's lots of loons, but I have noticed increased aggression in loons over the last 30 years. And I think that's mostly due to increased population, more loons, there's more, aggression, there's more trying to stake out place in the lake for their nest to build. And we do see quite a bit of chasing between resident birds and intruder birds. 
So Lewins will try to come back about year four, year five, access the lake, a territory year six or year seven. And at some point it feels it's, oh, it's just like a young, like an elk or a bighorn sheep might. And so it's going to come back to the lake and try to establish a territory. It will get tested. And typically those who are defending their territory have more at stake and are really to have higher motivation to defend it from an intruder. Now this is the breastplate of a loon and Mark Pokris was doing necropsies of loons and he noticed he kept finding these holes in the sternum or breastplate of loons. So he took the bill of a loon, placed it inside and sure enough, they matched perfectly. So Mark surmised that loons were attacking other loons and they were coming from underneath the surface so they would dive and come straight up and puncture the sternum. And that's obviously a sign of overt aggression, defense of a territory, for example, and what was interesting is Mark found that roughly half the loons had sternal punctures, but what was even more remarkable was that half of, the, half of the females had them as well as males. And so we tend to, tend to anthropomorphize male aggression with testosterone in people that maybe there's something with birds as well. And yet with loons, it seems like females might be just as aggressive as males. So I started branching out to try to catch loons in the winter time. And the technique we used in the breeding grounds was gonna help somewhat, but it was gonna be need, needing to be modified because loons on the breeding grounds are there to defend their chicks. And so they remain on the surface of the water and won't even come towards the boat. So if I make a chick distress call on the breeding grounds, the adult's gonna to come towards me and it's much easier to scoop it up. But on the wintering grounds, they're not defending chicks. Chicks and adults winter in different locations typically. Uh, they do not associate. So that's gonna have its own set of challenges for me. So typically you go out on a bigger boat, longer handled net, more people. And it just becomes just a little bit of a larger operation. And part of it really turned into being just a fair amount of luck is if you approached enough loons, eventually you were able to catch them, especially with the long handled net. And so far we've caught over 225 loons in the winter. And this is a loon that I caught with a colleague in 2004 in Morro Bay, Southern uh, California. And this bird has been reobserved through 2020. So for 17 years, this bird went back to the same location in the winter. So I will, in order to study these birds in the winter, wintering lakes or predominantly the ocean, I really needed to use radio telemetry. And so radio telemetry might cost $150 to $200 for a radio transmitter that you see here. And then you might need a receiver and antenna, which might be $1,000. And then you can track the loon across the ocean, or this is me in South Carolina at a freshwater reservoir. So this loon, you can't see the antenna, but it's there. There's a band on the bird as well. So we would follow these birds during the winter. Some would swim several miles a day, but they would never fly. And they consistently use the same area year and year after year. And oftentimes loons would go out in the ocean and forage at night in large rafts. I've seen rafts to 100 to 200 loons, usually smaller rafts of 30 to 60. So they feel security in numbers and they move away from the coastline to hopefully uh, reduce predation. Now, all adults will undergo a complete wing molt. So January through March, during that three month time span, they will become flightless. And so like all molting birds, uh, it's somewhat energetically expensive. And at this point, you might anticipate loons might be vulnerable without wings, but their natural reaction is to dive away from any kind of threat. So they are relatively safe, even though they're molting their wings at this time. Now, doing a lot of boating in the Gulf of Mexico, we did see come across large rafts of loons, 30 to 60 during the day. And there was one particular one that we anticipated and estimated to be over 600 individuals. So this is in response to flocking schooling fish, such as menhaden, and the loons would hoot and call each other and create this huge swarm. White uh, uh, brown pelicans would come in, northern gannets would come in, terns would fly, gulls would fly, and then you had this interspecies mixed association flock diving after the fish, 
it was quite a spectacle to see. So one of the stories I was going to tell you in, from my book is just that I spent quite a bit of time off the coast of Louisiana. And when I was out in the water, I oftentimes found a really odd juxtaposition. Here's the bottom of those dolphin with the wintering adult common loon. And oftentimes I would see them together. And you can imagine what a treat that would be. And I have a, a little story in the book that I'm just going to kind of probably go through it real briefly and just read it for you. But this is in January 2012. And we know loons are visual predators and the murky water in the Gulf of Mexico must have made it extremely challenging to locate prey. We were in a series of channels dotted with islands when we spotted a bottlenose dolphin. Any dolphin sighting makes for a great day, but this one was acting peculiar. It was swimming toward shore and then would swim back to the middle of the channel and repeat the same maneuver. What was it doing we were all saying to ourselves? We could see ripples of water near shore from fish racing away from the dolphin. It must be pushing schooling fish to shallower water to increase its foraging odds. That's it, we shouted to each other, amazing. Then we saw a common loon following the wake of the dolphin as it moved toward shore. At first we were skeptical, but the longer we observed, the more certain we were that the loon was consciously swimming back and forth each time in the wake to get any fish the dolphin missed. And so we have observed this several times and just, just what a fortunate uh, opportunity to observe this interspecies communication between a dolphin and a common loon. And I had to show you a picture of a dolphin. So another techniques that researchers use are these tools called geolocators. It's attached just above the metal band in this picture. I don't think I've got a close up of it here. That allows you to download lat and long, but also you can use depth pressure sensors. So when the bird is diving underwater, it's gonna make a depth profile. How far does it dive? How long? How long does it stay at the surface? So they're very useful tools. They may cost between three and $400, just to give you an idea. But you need to retrieve them. So generally you need to put them on banded birds in the winter, in the summer, because you're more likely to retrieve them. If I put a geolocator on a wintering loon, I, I couldn't guarantee I was going to catch it again. So this just shows you some data from the Lake Michigan in the fall. A researcher, Kevin Keenow, put out some geolocators. And just I want to show you what, he, what, what Kevin found from some of his data. So we're looking on the x-axis on the bottom from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And on the, on the, on the y-axis, you can see the depth below the surface in meters. So starting around nine o'clock, loons started making consistent dives, five or 10 dives, all the way to like 135 to 150 feet. Then they would come up on the surface for 10, 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, and they would repeat that dive cycle literally on and off for six hours. So we know loons can dive up to 200 feet, and I'm often asked, can loons dive further than that? So here's some species of penguins, which we feel loons are comparable to. If you look at the weight of penguins, so 454 grams is a pound. So the little penguins are about two pounds, medium penguins are about 10 pounds, and the large ones closer to like 15 pounds. If you look at the depth, it's really correlated strongly with body mass. So the larger loon, and in this case, the larger penguin is gonna dive deeper than a smaller penguin. And when we look at duration of times, we can see large penguins staying underwater for eight minutes. So loons are between 4,000 and 6,000 grams. So they're probably fit into that medium category. So it's very likely, you know, loons can dive to 300 feet. We have pretty strong data to suggest at least 240 feet. And I wouldn't be surprised if a loon could dive to 300 feet. And we've had loons underwater for four to five minutes, which is right in that three to six minute range. Now you could put a satellite transmitter on a loon and you'd have to track it. So a satellite transmitter, depending on when we first purchased them, was over $2,000. Today, it's around $1,500 to get one satellite transmitter. And then you have to fly a wildlife vet who's trained in this procedure, along with the equipment and gear. And so it can get a little pricey. But the information you can glean is certainly justifiable in terms of the cost. So it took a little while to figure out the best way how to do this. But these are like subabdominal implants in loons. Uh, that antenna is extraordinarily soft, as is those radius and radio antenna. 
And let's just tell you a story. The very first time we tried to deploy satellite transmitters was 1998 in Walker Lake, Nevada. And so Walker Lake's just a little south and east of Reno, quite a bit away from Las Vegas. And what's fascinating is most of you are like, this is desert country, this is Nevada. It's a huge lake. Well, this is a major stopover place. And Nevada Department of Fish and Wildlife recognized it. And there were over a thousand loons that would stop there in the spring and return again in the fall, feeding on these native fish that were of the right size class that loons preferred. So our job, Dave and I were brought out there to try to catch the loons, to help implant satellite transmitters, to just figure out where these loons were going and where they returned. So that's the best laid plants of mice and men. And I tell the story in the book. And I'll just tell you just real briefly, and real, I'll just read you just a couple lines from the book, from this event that take, took place, was that wildlife research involves roving parts. And sometimes things are not always going according to plan. So here's an example. So Dave and I were at Walker Lake teaming up with researchers, Mike Yates and Mark Fuller from Boise State University, Larry Neal from the Nevada Department of Wildlife and Kevin Keenow from the US Geological Survey. Each team was there to do a specific job. Mike and Mark from Boise State were the leaders of the project. The team from Nevada had the boats, the drivers and the expertise, expertise to navigate around the lake and the USGS staff were responsible for conducting surgeries and then planning the transmitters. So bottom line is we had to settle on a week to do this. We chose one week in April, the third week, and we were hoping everything was gonna go just fine. Well, what happened is this is a high uh, elevation lake. Winds can weep through this valley very strong and the water can get very dangerous. And so literally we had one or two days that we were gonna be able to go out and it was forecast that the winds were gonna to be too high. And it just turns out the satellite transmitters had not arrived on our first night. So the question was, do we go out at night and catch these loons and hold them and get the satellite transmitters the next day or do we wait and go out the second night? Well, the consensus was, let's just see if we can catch these birds. Well, we caught some, we caught five, we kept the three largest. And the question is, well, where are we gonna put them? Well, we ended up putting them in a box, padded, protected, and we, we made sure we, we had to, base, basically we had to put them in our hotel room, right? Just for overnight. And then the next morning, the satellite transmitters arrived. We conducted the surgeries and I'll show you the results briefly from that. So here's a bird with a satellite transmitter on it. So the birds flew from Walker Lake, Nevada to Saskatchewan. And they literally made it there within a month. And the story could end there, but something unusual and remarkable happened 13 years later. And so I'm gonna jump forward 13 years. In 2011, these are some researchers that I've worked with in the past. And we were gonna put satellite transmitters in some loons in the Gulf of Mexico. So we catch two birds at random, we put satellite transmitters in them and we plot their journeys. So this is right off the coast of Louisiana and uh, spent 10 days in Tennessee at a reservoir. This is a male bird, 15 days in Lake Michigan, six days in Lake Winnipeg, and flew up to Northern Saskatchewan, stayed there 2000, for a trip of 2,309 miles. And then we caught the other bird off the coast of Louisiana. It spent 20 days off the Mississippi coast before it went to Nor a reservoir in North Carolina, Chesapeake Bay for nine days, Lake Erie for 12, Lake Huron for 10 days, Lake Winnipeg for two or three, and again, went to Northwest Saskatchewan, 2,776 miles. So to my knowledge, that's the longest distance we've ever recorded a loon migrate. And by the way, these loons were very small. So to fly from the interior here over 2,000 miles, their body size reflects that. Loons that migrate short distances are considerably larger in size. So I thought we should plot the birds at Walker Lake with the birds from the Gulf of Mexico. And when you do that, you can see it looks like they overlap. And if we zoom in, the very thin line is the bird from Walker Lake. The thick line is a bird from the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see Peter Pond Lake, they overlap there. And you can zoom in on this with the thick line being the Louisiana tag bird and the thin line being birds from uh, Walker Lake ultimately. The fact that these birds ended up on the same water body and they were in two different ocean basins, one winter on the, in the Pacific, the other in the Gulf of Mexico, 
the fact that they came together on this one lake was truly remarkable. And the odds of that were extraordinarily slim. So we do know that loons in Saskatchewan in the Northwest corner, some of them migrate in winter off the Pacific Ocean and some will migrate to the Gulf of Mexico. So we did some surgeries on loons in Maine with, we had a little bit of money for that. And we just reaffirmed what loon biologists has always thought that pair members winter in different locations. So like the Aziskahas female was just south of Cape Cod and the Aziskahas male was up in Booth Bay. This was the same pair that had chicks when we caught them. They were on Aziskahas Lake up in the Range City Lakes area. And this is what we've always felt that males and females of the same pair winter in different locations. And you can see in this case, the Flagstaff female wintered off Maryland and the male again was kind of closer to like Bar Harbor, Booth Bay as well. So in every instance, the females migrated further than males did. And this just shows you a brief picture of the distribution of the birds from one year to the next. Now, normally satellite transmitters last a year and then they, the battery wipes out. Uh, those put on bald eagles, peregrine falcons, and albatrosses are solar powered, so they're able to, to recharge. But the, but the ones we put in loons, that's not a possibility. But what is remarkable here is the bird used the same area between years. So whether it was off the coast of Maryland or south of Cape Cod, the birds were found there consistently. Lastly, a tool we can use as a video or a camcorder, right? We can set that up by a nest, for example, and monitor what happens during a nest. So here you can see a loon getting off the nest. You can see the bands on the birds. And we can track if there's any predators in the area, any human disturbance, for example. So this is a bird up in Rangeley Lake. Uh, and it looks like it's fairly high above the water. It's on an island. But it just turned out that a boat came by speeding, created a large wake, flooded the nest, and the egg actually was pushed off from the nest. And this bird had to re-nest. Here you can see like a, a mink coming out at night. Now, a mink's not going to be a threat if the loon is sitting on the nest. It might be a threat to the egg if the loon adult was not incubating. Here's a picture of a river otter. And then Fido, most of us uh, listening to Bill talk about trying to keep our cats indoors. Well, sometimes dogs have good intentions, but they're curious, they're exploring, and they can chase a loon off a nest as well. And this one's just kind of what happens when you have a camera out showing a picture of a moose. And the moose is just working the shoreline coming across the a loon nest. And you can see the loon in return is making itself small and trying to be inobtrusive. And then here you can see a subadult bald eagle in the background of this loon. The eagle did come down and try to attack the loon. The loon did get away, but there was a little scuttle. And again, the value of using some video technology with that. Okay, you made it through part two and part three is pretty sh is short comparatively. So a number of us were thinking about is it possible to translocate loons from one place to another place? And this really came up because Southern Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan has, there's been a retraction of loons in those Midwestern states. Unclear why that exactly is, but there's probably some hunting involved, human development, for example, shoreline encroachment. And so it's fascinating just as an exercise to think, can we translocate loons from one place to another? How best would we do that? Well, we would probably take chicks that are six to eight weeks old. And if we can get them to implant on this new lake, they then potentially, they would return there and establish a breeding pair. So this was a project that uh, I helped initiate back in 2014. I worked on this for several years. We ended up translocating 20 chicks over three years, 285 miles from Northern Minnesota to southern Minnesota. One of my jobs was to find release lakes or breeding lakes that still had suitable habitat that weren't overdeveloped. This is Fish Lake in southern Minnesota. You can see we ended up deciding to put a, like a, uh, an enclosure. We needed to put burlap and lining that enclosure as well that kept the loons calm. Uh, we fed the loons. Yes, we tried to kind of hide ourselves from that. 
We poured fish into a funnel into the enclosure, which the loons ate readily. And so for the most part, the project went off uh, without too many hitches and was somewhat successful. This is the first release of a loon chick ever, 15 August, 2014. And one of my more just excitable moments is the loon researcher being part of this project. So a part two project, Dave Evers continued this work in Massachusetts, trying to move main chicks or chicks from New York to Massachusetts to see if we can establish another uh, area where there used to have been loons historically, but were not of recent. And what Dave was able to get was that some a chick that had moved from New York to Puckshaw Pond in Massachusetts in 2015, returned there three years later in 2018, paired with a male and successfully produced a chick. And so in other words, it imprinted, it didn't go back to New York and went back to Massachusetts where it was born, where, where it was left and established a, a pair there. So there's, it suggests that this kind of technique can be used if it was needed as a conservation tool. But really some of the more immediate aspects of loons and conservation are fluctuating water levels. So due to reservoirs and depending on if we get heavy rainfalls, Loons can build up their nests somewhat, but they, they, there's, there's a limit to how much they can actually build up their nests before they're flooded. And so this is a picture of an egg and a nest that's flooded and was unsuccessful. And loons typically will nest right near the edge where there's very deep water so they can escape a bald eagle predation uh, possibility, for example. So a number of agencies and groups, private citizen groups are trying to put out platforms to augment the loss of loons, chicks, or loon eggs to flooding. These have been fairly or relatively successful. They've been modified over the years by trying to put some webbing over the nest. In this way, it kind of minimizes its apparent openness to an eagle or like a gull or a crow or even a raven, for example. And there's had some success. And it's just, we've had lots of conservation groups, organizations working. And we've come tremendous ways in just two or three decades with educating people about loons, needing to be low, uh, low wake zones, give the loons some space when they have chicks, trying to reduce boat trauma, for example. And we've had quite a bit of success, mostly to the dedication of lots of loon biologists, private citizens. And we have a success story. Loons in New York, Vermont, New Hampshire uh, are now doing very well in, in Massachusetts because of these conservation efforts. And more than ever, there's great communication between state agencies, federal agencies, county groups, lake associations, loon organizations, and the amount of sharing of knowledge is at an all time high. And it's very exciting to be a part of that. One of the things we're concerned about is emerging diseases. So there's a loon that had malaria, West Nile virus, so we're starting to see a few individuals with that. Is that going to turn into to be a larger problem? Well, we're unsure about that, but we do have uh, wildlife vets and pathologists who are on standby investigating that. So I think I got through the talk in just about the right amount of time. I, you know, I've been very grateful to have many people who've helped me, guided me, worked with me for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I feel very blessed to be with just wonderful, wonderful people. I also have worked with 52 biologists in the field for at least a week. So all these people have dedicated their time, expertise, and it's been a really joy for me. Working out at night, seeing the Northern Lights, for example, it's been really spectacular. And I also wanna thank a lot of researchers, uh, loon researchers who I've collaborated with, shared information with over the years. Uh, their dedication <laughs> is tremendous. And lastly, I've worked with 288, 48 volunteers. And most of my, and I would want to thank them. They've worked with me like a week in the field. And I'd like to thank Earthwatch Institute based in Boston that has supported lots of my research over several decades. And of course, I have to thank my family because I've been gone from home and they've been very supportive of my trips. So thanks to the family. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, photo credits, uh, well-deserved of those good friends of mine. And then here's my local website. So thanks everybody for tuning in. And get a cup of water and then we'll go for some questions. 
Yeah. Thank you, Jim. That was wonderful. We do have several uh, questions as soon as you're uh, ready to uh, defend your thesis. Thank you, Kathy. Go for it. Uh, do you have uh, a sense of the populations, the, the worldwide populations of the different loon species and how they are faring? Yeah, it, it's actually, it seems that the one that's probably most concerned is the yellow billed loon because of its restricted range it's across Eurasia, like Russia and Canada and Alaska. And it's because of its restricted range and potential uh, oil development in some of these very fragile landscapes. The loons have, the yellow billed loon has extraordinary sensitivity to humans. So, because on the landscape of the tundra in which they occupy, anything taller than two or three feet is becomes very alerts them. And of course, when you see, they see people across the landscape, they're very alarmed by that. Mm -hmm. So the other birds, red-throated, they're doing mostly fine, uh, Pacific loons as well, and Arctic loons. But I think they, without a doubt, the yellow-billed loon's the one that's been the most uh, right. least concerned. What's, what's the estimate of their population? I think it's over a couple thousand, couple thousand pairs of loons up in, just in the, in the Alaska region. Right. And on the other end, how, how, what's an estimate of the number of common loons? Yeah, so probably worldwide around 650,000. So roughly 240 or 250,000 pairs of loons. Yeah, and, and is there a sense of how that's, how they fared over the last century? Are they declining? Well, yeah, I think that's, that's fair. I think what we found with loons is I suspect what happened is DDT took a hit on loons in this, you know, probably 40s, 50s, 60s. I think we, we see examples of, uh, of hunting which hit uh, some loon numbers as well. And then just uh, lake lakeshore development had a big impact on loons. So I think loons have been rebounding since that. So I think loons were kind of nearing a low in the 1900s, 1940s, 50s, DDT. And then what we've seen is we've seen a rebound of loons since the 70s and 80s. We've seen more loons in New Hampshire, Vermont, for example, uh, than we've had in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's certainly better than some species. A lot of the smaller songbirds are considerably uh, threatened to a considerably greater degree. Uh, we have one question about uh, siblings. Uh, are there are there typically two eggs and two chicks, or what what is the norm, and how competitive are they? How cutthroat are they with each other with their siblings? Yeah, that's a great question. And I talk about this a little bit in the book because I observed a, a siblicide event where the older chick pecked the younger chick to, to death after like 18 days. And other loon researchers and just other folks who've paid attention have watched some siblicide that's taken place. So for the most part, a loon, if you're gonna go through the trouble of building a nest, you know, better to lay two eggs and have some insurance in case one is uh, inviolable. So loons typically will lay two eggs, both will hatch, but they'll hatch about a day apart. And so the one chick that born first is always larger consistently what we found during that you know, four, six week period when they're developing. And for some reason, and it's unclear, and it, I would say it's not due to shortage of food by any stretch or neglect by the, neglect by the parents, but occasionally we will see an older sibling peck the younger sibling. And not always to death, but we will see some aggression. And we have seen some siblicide. But for the most part, that's uncommon. And most of them will kind of be able to be supported by their parents and be able to raise two chicks. I will add this. This is kind of an extension. So, so chicks are vulnerable definitely during the first two weeks, right? That's when their motor skills are undeveloped. And up until four weeks of age, around five or six weeks of age, their motor skills have developed where they can dive quickly, they're more alert. And so if a loon chick can make it to four weeks and certainly by six weeks, it's more likely to be able to fledge successfully. So that's probably the tenuous time in the life of a loon chick is the early two to four week period. Jay, you, you mentioned a number of the threats before, but is uh, lead uh, from 
fishing gear, uh, it, does that impact loans for, right. through, via lead, lead poisoning? Sure, right. And lead toxicosis continues to be a concern and take a number of loans. So out of the necropsies that have been done in New Hampshire, we see like 30, 40% of the loons have died of lead toxicosis. And so to clarify, just one split shot of mm -hmm. lead ingested by a loon, and why would a loon do that? Well, loons use their gizzard to grind up fish bones, right? And so sometimes they're on the bottom of the sediment picking up pebbles. And we're not really sure what the selection process is with that, but it seems that ultimately they can pick up a split shot and that's enough to cause lead toxicosis. So, so several New England states, right, have had restrictions on, on lead or size of fishing tackle. And I think they have been very successful. I know out in Washington state, they re reduced lead fishing on 13 of 14 breeding lakes. And over 10 years, we've seen loons have much higher mortality or le much less mortality, higher survivorship. And it's kind of a success story. So if someone's looking for some some evidence that fishing, lead fishing tackle having success on loon chicks, that would be one place I would direct them. Yeah, our, uh, you know, in some of your shots, there were quite a few loons gathered in on a body of water. Uh, is that seen in Maine at all, or for, further offshore? Yeah, so any, was, sure, I think. Did, yeah, I think I've got the question and you can fill me in, Bill, if I, I didn't quite get it. But one of the things that loons are noted for and something I studied for four years, was really intrigued by, is by mid to late summer, loons engage in what we've called social gatherings, where they'll you leave their partner, swim out into the middle of the lake, other loons will join them, they'll go through these very ritualized behaviors, lion swimming, circle diving. And it's really a curiosity why loons would do that like mid to late summer. And they'll hoot, they're mostly relaxed. And so I was able to put some bands on loons and watch them. And a number of the loons that were interacting in these social gatherings were unbanded birds. So they were coming from outside the wildlife refuge where I was studying. And I think these were birds that were like reconnaissance for potential territories, potential mates. And so I think there's some of that that takes place. So on freshwater lakes, mid to late summer through the fall, we tend to see that. And I also think we've seen gatherings on large lakes, the Finger Lakes in New York, some big lakes here in Maine, New Hampshire, Squam, Winnipesaukee, and others, where loons will tend to aggregate in the fall and form fairly large flocks and might enhance their feeding success as necessary. And then we do see some of that taking place in the ocean as well. But a lot of oceanic birds tend to be solitary uh, that's a long discussion as well, but there are some social aspects of loons in the winter, but many of them are solitary as well. So hopefully that answered. Uh, yep. Yes, thank you. Uh, when, how, when the first winter arrives uh, for the young chicks, uh, how do they, do they migrate to the winter uh, saltwater areas with their parents or are they on their own? Yeah, and we were always fascinated by that because some populations of birds, you know, the young loon, the migration route from the adults, but in loons, the adults leave the chicks two weeks to six weeks before the, the chicks depart. And so they have to figure out where to go, right? And so there must be some genetic predisposition in terms of orientation and probably detecting some levels of magnetic field around the earth and know somewhat to fly south, southwest, or south, southeast. There seems to be some movement. And I do feel when they, once they get to the ocean, this is a new environment for them. And what I've noticed with young birds that are like six, seven months old, as they really try to watch adults, they're queuing in to like, what should I be feeding? What should I be eating? How should I be doing this? And I've almost seen the situation where a dog works into a bay or a cove and then the, the, the chick or the young bird now, the immature six, seven months old, following the doll and learning. So I think there's quite a bit of learning by observation in loons during the winter time. Well, that's, that's great. 
uh, uh, pretty much covers our questions. Uh, <clears throat> it has been an absolute pleasure to have you with us here tonight. Uh, I encourage people to check out Jim's website, uh, jamesperuk.com, and uh, check out his book as well. And thank you so much for joining us. Hey, appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And we hope to see everyone next month. Good night. Good night.